Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining Hashtag No Limits. Hashtag No Limits is about people whose society has placed limits upon, but who have busted through those limits. There is no better example of that to me than the caterpillar turning into the butterfly. And a saying from Hamlet by Ophelia in which she says, we know who we are, but not who we will be who we will be. And I kind of have, I always get the wrong side. I kind of have both things on the poster behind me. I know y'all can't see it very well, but it does say the the phrase and it does have the caterpillar developing into the butterfly. It's not easy for that caterpillar to develop to that butterfly. It goes into literal cells and then reforms into the butterfly and then has to struggle to get its way out of the cocoon in order to be strong enough to fly. And while that is no easy task, Neither is breaking through the limits that society has placed upon a person. And today, I am happy to welcome my guest, Andre Pineda, and he is going to be telling us some of the limits that his daughter, Sophia, has broken through in her journey through life to this point. So, Andre, welcome, and thank you for joining me on Hashtag No Limits. Thank you for having me. Delighted to be here. Awesome. So, yeah, so tell us, oh, and I always... I I do this every time I get through all that whole introduction and I forget the business part. If you're watching us live, give us a hashtag live. If you're watching it in the replay, hashtag replay, make sure you like, you subscribe, you share. Um, This is our way of getting people's stories out and hoping to use these stories to change people's perspectives. So the more you share it, the more you like it, the more you comment, the more Facebook moves it around and shows it to all the different people. So go ahead and do all that businessy stuff while we're having our conversation. So, sorry, Andre, tell us about yourself and your family. Sure, so my name is Andre Pineda. I live in Fredericksburg, Virginia with my wife, Caroline Cando Pineda. And uh, we have two children, our son, Miguel, who now lives in Atlanta, and then our daughter, who seems to be much better known than any of us, Sophia Pineda, uh, who is a junior at James Monroe High School here at our local high school. Awesome. Awesome. So what brings you to hashtag no limits? What is it about Sophia that she was told, oh, she isn't going to be able to because of Sure. So Sophia is our miracle child. So we found out about 18 weeks in utero uh, back in 2003, I'm losing track of time, um, (laughs) that, you know, Sophia was born with a very significant uh, cardiac defect that could be, um, you know, life threatening. She very well uh, could pass away uh, right at birth. So, you know, we were really stunned by the news because we weren't expecting anything like that. And, um, you know, th- things happen for weird reasons. So we remember that our son was uh, in the room with us when the doctor told us that. And, you know, at the time, so, uh, Miguel was seven, seven and a half. And that was probably not the wisest thing that the doctor had done. But so, you know, we had no idea what it was going to be. And, um, you know, it was a really scary uh, time for us. Um, but, you know, we were very fortunate uh, to meet our now cardiologist uh, back then who gave us the great hope that, you know, at least some correction cardiac-wise could occur at Sophia's birth. So that gave us a lot of hope. You know, it was a very stressful time. That was probably the worst two weeks of our life, not knowing exactly, you know, what was going to do and what the prognosis were, et cetera. Um, but we got through that, and Sophia was born. And at least to my surprise, I think, quite frankly, Carol deep down knew, but to my surprise, Sophia was born with Down syndrome as well. Okay. So, I mean, you know, that became our journey initially was, you know, the first couple years of her life was just getting her through all the cardiac surgeries and keeping her alive. Uh, she did have a uh, first corrective cardiac surgery at four months, uh, yeah, four months old. We were able to uh, postpone that. She was born, um, Carol's much better with all the specifics, but she was born with half a heart. So she had a Fontan, uh, she had hypoplastic left heart syndrome, um, et cetera. But she got through that. And then um, at the time I had changed careers to do what I do now. Um, I'm an attorney by training and became a financial advisor. Uh, And then, you know, we made the decision when Sophia was born and we knew the issues that we were facing us, that uh, Carol, who was a federal employee, would continue to work in federal service. And then 
uh, you know, I made the difficult decision to stop working for a while. So I was a stay-at-home dad for, you know, about 18 months, took care of Sophia and another friend of ours, baby. And then we were able to get through Sophia's second uh, open heart surgery. And then that went successfully. And then we were able to focus much more on the Down syndrome side of us. So in addition to that, she was born with apraxia. She was born, uh, you know, uh, she needs constant speech therapy. You know, we were told early on that, you know, she didn't know, if, uh, many thought she wasn't going to be able to walk, um, that, you know, we had to prepare ourselves for a walker, all of that. So, you know, it was it was very stressful during the early years. I tend to forget a lot about these things until I start talking about it. Sure. So there's a couple of things that you talked about. So first of all, um, I think I'm at episode 70 something um, by now with this. And you are the first stay at home dad that oh, great. has been on the show. So I'm excited to to, to share, share that with everybody. And and what a cool thing. Um, I'm sure that wasn't an easy decision for, for your family to come to. And um, but, you know, kudos to all of you for for being able to make it work. Sure. And um, so you talked a little bit about your son being in the room when you were given the news by the doctor at the time. And it sounded like it was a, a very much more doom and gloom than any kind of but there could be hope of. Is is that a correct? Yeah, I think that's very fair. Um uh, it, 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 there's a lot of misconceptions when it comes to birth and to the whole, you know, development process in utero. So when people see very significant defects, you know, there is many people will rush to the judgment that they know best as to what the expectations may be on birth as to what the future is. And, you know, I don't care what side of the debate people are on a lot of the emotional issues, such as abortion, et cetera. But I think one thing that's a very unifying theme among many of us with different political persuasions and thoughts is that, you know, you can give information in neutral ways that is not prejudging what you're going to do. And in fact, the Kennedy um, uh, Brownback bill back, I believe it was in 05 or 06, really did do that federally, that, that passed with bipartisan support across the political spectrum. The problem is, is that those were never, it was never fully funded. Right. So, you know, the medical community was never really given that information, at least from a, um, you know, a federal health standpoint uh, to provide such information. So there's a lot of negative bias that's out there. And that's perhaps our greatest criticism of that. And I think I'm sure you've discussed this many times with your audience. And, uh, you know, I, I think most people, if they're honest, would say that there is just a lot of negative preconceptions as to what things are, and things would lead to a lot better um, alternatives in many respects if people were more neutral in the information that they were providing. I agree with you. And yes, you're right. I've had several guests on who have spoken of all the negatives that they were given. And whether that was at birth and a diagnosis was was recognized or if it was in utero. And again, yeah, the whole, um, I actually, I wrote a book called Those Who Can't Teach. And they're all true stories of families who have a child in the family with a disability and, and what the experiences are like for a family like yours that is different than mine. Mm -hmm. And, you know, kind of how those things are similar and, and also how they're different. And, and the major differences were those negatives. Um, I remember one of the stories and, and this particular family, her, their daughter was born with Down syndrome and they found out during pregnancy and it was for several visits after they found out where the doctor kept offering for the family to get an abortion, even though they had adamantly, according to the parents, said, no, we, we, mm -hmm. that's not the option that we're going to go with. And there is so much, like you said, just negativity. And to, I think, offer that information of this could happen but so could this. Sure. Right. You know, right. and, and because you do want to prepare people, you know, for, for what could be, but we have to remember that the could be is exactly that. It's just, a could be, it doesn't. I think that's, that's negative. very, very fair. I mean, 
you know, Down syndrome by definition, and I think most people are aware that there are, you know, links between cardiac defects and Down syndrome. I didn't know that really at the time. Um, but I think one of the things that, especially in the medical community, that folks tend to forget is Down syndrome by definition, syndrome by definition is a range of things that can happen. It's not one specific thing or another. And I think one of the downsides of the medical community is they just don't have enough exposure. I mean, it is a lot of more theoretical discussion than real discussion. And, you know, we strongly believe that people need to make decisions that are appropriate for themselves. You know, I'm not about to sit in somebody else's shoes for that. But I can only tell you that from our experience, from my experience personally, I mean, we have learned so much from Sophia. Uh, it's really opened our world into a different world that we were on the periphery of. I mean, we we knew about it. We were always supportive of a lot of the efforts of those communities. But it's like everything. All of a sudden, when you personally start experiencing it, then all of a sudden you start viewing things a little bit differently because it's no longer a theoretical discussion. Right, exactly. I had the great privilege uh, some time ago, the book's been out about a year, and, and uh, at one of my doctor visits, I happened to have the book with me, and my doctor is, has always done a beautiful job of sitting and talking with me and listening to me about, you know, whatever medical reason I'm there. Well, in this particular day, there was a resident there, and um, I was sharing with my doctor, oh, hey, I released my book, and so I was telling him about it. And I then had the opportunity with that resident to share some bedside manner, quote unquote, <laughs> ideas and suggestions for that resident. And and even my family physician was, you know, like, yeah, this isn't something that gets taught. You right. know, it's, it's it's a lot of the theory. It's a lot of, okay, these symptoms could be this, 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 and this, you know, and, and how do you, what do you do with that information? And they take out the, the personal component but I think that's not just in the medical field. I, I mean, no. I think that happens in the education field most definitely. Because oh, yeah. I think you're exactly right. I mean, what's just so frustrating to us, and again, I'm sure many folks that you've interviewed would have very similar thoughts, but what's frustrating to us is just assumptions that are made when if people would view things a little bit more broadly, mm -hmm. then they would end up finding out that the assumptions maybe don't carry a lot of validity. Right. And I think that's one thing that, you know, Sophia has shown us. I think, you know, I've come to the conclusion through the years because nobody tells you, I tell this all the time when I'm selling Sophia's art in the farmer's markets, et cetera, but nobody tells you in the special needs community, it gets harder as you get, your child gets older. And I've come to the conclusion that the reason why people do that is they don't want to overwhelm you with what the future is going to be when the day-to-day -day is difficult. Sure. And I think, you know, if people were more honest across the board and recognizing that, you know, our special needs children are true gifts to us and to the world, mm -hmm. but it is hard. <laughs> you know? Absolutely, yeah. And a lot of people want to gloss over that and just focus on, you know, a miracle. Well, you know, yes, every child is one, right? You know, every child has pros and cons and, you know, times where, you know, you really are not too thrilled with the person, but that has less to do with the disability than it just has to do with being human. Right. 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 Exactly. Um, but I think if more focused on the realities of it, then, you know, it would just be far more candid of, of how things are going to go uh, that can change things in so many different ways. You know, a lot of people, you know, are very surprised to find out, and please stop me if I'm going too long. Um, but, you know, many people are surprised that some of the worst offenders on low expectations are in the faith community. Oh, wow. Oh, yes. I mean, you know, we happen to be Catholic, but I mean, you know, most Catholic um, churches do not offer special needs religious education. Interesting. Oh, yeah. I mean, there's a lot, of, a, a lot of talk about inclusion and not a lot of walk behind the talk. I mean, you know, we are parishioners at Holy Trinity in Georgetown in D.C. We live in Fredericksburg. It's about 55 miles away. Um, but in addition to being a Jesuit-based institution, um, they are one of the few religious uh, on the Catholic side in particular that have a whole special needs ministry. I mean, they've done a wonderful job trying to outreach to that community. 
but it's not unusual to hear, especially, you know, I'm a little bit more familiar on the Catholic side, but, you know, many people came to Holy Trinity because of how, um, you know, they were perceived to be, uh, you know, in the other uh, places where they were going previously. Yeah. Um, but it's it's not, it, I think it would surprise a lot of people that that problem is uniform, education, health, religious entities, etc. Right. Yeah. And again, there there's that society placing those limits. And Correct. when I when I say that, I don't mean that they're physically placing no, limits. No. It's a it's a mentality. It's a it thought is. process. It's, you know, oh, well, yeah, everybody should be included. Oh, well, I don't know what to do with this child. So they have to go over here, you know. Right, right. <laughs> and so And you have to come in with an open heart. I mean, we tease all the time that we are one of the most devoted Catholic families of the Presbyterian Church here locally. You know, Sophia has been in uh, Presbyterian youth groups, same with Miguel. Um, you know, they've been just a wonderfully accepting group and they've gone out of their way to include anyone who wants to be a part of it. You know, yeah. that, again, we know we're very fortunate to have those experiences because so many people do not. Right. So I would like to dig into that a little bit more, because as you're saying that, I, I'm thinking of, of denominations that I've been a part of and churches, groups. Uh, and, and yeah, um, and I believe I had a guest a, a few weeks ago and he had said the same thing that with his daughter. And I think it was Catholic, but maybe it was but maybe it was Lutheran because, and I, I just remember that he was talking about confirmation and mm -hmm. how he developed his own program curriculum mm -hmm. for his daughter to be confirmed because there was nothing in his, in his church. And I, I think it was Catholic, but I don't know. I it just could, remember it, there was confirmation so that it could have been. Catholic. Yeah, it could be, um, you know, it tends to be a little bit more Catholic focused in this area because of, you know, the church's doctrine on a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it is it is frustrating to see that. And again, you have to have people that are trained and learning how to deal with the differently able. You know, you have to develop curriculum that is great. Actually, Loyola Press has a whole great uh, group of religious education materials that are geared for the differently abled. So they, they have like uh, face cards that explain like what mass is about and how to be oh. stewards of the earth. And, you know, but it's a lot less focused on the rote memory of a prayer. Right. Um, and, you know, that is, that's an issue because many of our kids are not going to be able to do, you know, right. typical prayer type things, especially in Catholicism. Some of the other religions are a little bit, you know, less on that and a little bit more, um, I don't know what the right terminology is, but just a little bit more open or relaxed in some of the rules. So, you know, like right. Unitarianism, for instance, may be a little bit more free flowing of that. Um, right. You know, the Episcopals here locally have also been wonderful too. And in fact, Sophia has gone to Episcopal summer camp. Uh, St. Elizabeth's camp has been wonderful as well. So, but it takes efforts of people to do that. And it takes the continuum of efforts to do it. It can't just be a one-time deal. And it's, right. it's very, very difficult to do. And you have to have people trained in it. Right. And that's the thing a lot of times is that training piece. Um, because I know in, even in the education system, I know that we are having shortages all across the country for teachers as well as paraprofessionals or teacher Correct. assistants, whatever they're called in, in all the different areas. And I thought of it the other day because recently I had heard of a person who had taken a vacancy and, and filled in, but the person really wasn't doing much as far as, you know, what I would have considered the best way or the, or the most mm -hmm. appropriate way. And I thought, so is it better to have a person there with no training? Because at least then you have a person or, you know, how do we solve that? Because if there's shortage of people and you get somebody, you want, you want to grab that person up, but do you want the person or do you want the skills to be able to really do the job? You know, I, I feel like our education system is, is really on a, a balancing act right now. If, and, and a lot of actual occupations, sure. you know, because I know there's shortages of, of workers all over the place. Um, so yeah, it's that training piece that, you know, being able to find somebody to train and being able to have someone who's able to come in and train. <laughs> right, right, right. Well, and, the, and again, to kind of set the expectation on that. And then the reality is, is on top of all of that, um, 
you know, so many people in the special needs field when it comes to child care related issues, paraprofessionals, et cetera, you know, they are paid the equivalent of what you would be paying somebody at Walmart. Right. So, I mean, you know, honestly, it, sometimes less. Right. And it's one of my greatest frustrations. You know, I'm, you know, a financial advisor. I deal with people who have thousands all the way to millions. And it's just, I think people would be shocked to find out, you know, ultimately, if you really think about it, what we are valuing the services that these folks provide that can make a world of difference. I mean, even if I can't convince people on the political intellectual discussion about what the right thing to do is on a moral spot, I mean, from a taxpayer standpoint, it's pretty outrageous that we end up spending so little on these types of programs of early intervention and teacher retention and all of that, and then are shocked to find out on the back end that we have to pay significantly more for medical expenses, group um, housing, Medicaid, I mean, right. you name it. It's just, it's just a very bizarre way of approaching things to me. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yes. And and I, I was always fortunate as a special education teacher to have anywhere from one to um, at one time, I think there were nine paraprofessionals mm. under, you know, that worked with my kiddos throughout the district. And um, yeah, the, the value that I placed on them was hopefully what they deserved. Sure. Um, but the value that the school placed upon their as far as income Right. You know, and even some of the other staff and faculty in the school didn't appreciate the paraprofessionals as much as they should have been. Oh, most definitely. And they're, you know, they are critical components of it. And, you know, we've had mixed experiences through the years in our school system. In the early years, it wasn't great. It's been significantly better. And, um, you know, these days we have, you know, just wonderful teachers that really believe in Sophia. And for the most part, we truly have had that. But, you know, as good as a teacher can be, as good as a paralegal can be, if the administration doesn't believe in that, then that's not going to move the needle much either. You know, right. and that's that's another dirty little secret that I think a lot of people um, don't realize the power within a school of what leadership can do and how teachers can just have totally different points of view. Because legally, you know, they have to speak as one voice. Right. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, you can read between the lines in a lot of different ways. And, you know, you kind of, you know, it, when it becomes an advocate for, you know, you as a parent, you, you know when to push and when not to. And that's another difficult, um, you know, road. There's a reason why many in the differently able community choose to either homeschool or do something different because they've had negative experiences in the public school setting. Yeah. Yeah. So we could get into some long discussions about all of those <laughs> kinds of things, but I want this discussion to be about Sophie and yes. all, sorry, I, I shortened it to Sophie. Do you call her Sophie or Sophia? Sophia, but you okay. know, she's known by Sophie, you name it. She'll answer to just about anything and she's quick to correct you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so yeah, I want to focus on her. And so you had mentioned, you know, that a lot of people made assumptions about her when she was born, when she was growing up. And, and so tell us some of those assumptions that were made that were found to be incorrect assumptions. Well, I think one of the assumptions was that, you know, because, you know, she had Down syndrome to begin with, that there wasn't going to be a whole lot of expectation for her. You know, that in the early years was tough. When we first started school, because here in Virginia, you start early intervention in um, the second year. So early intervention in the Virginia is from age two to five. Prior to that is community services board. But when we transitioned over to the school system, you know, they immediately wanted to put her in the most restrictive environment. And we didn't quite realize that at the time. Right. But when we found out where she was placed, you know, we were not really happy with that. And we had to fight that. And eventually, you know, we decided for her to do kindergarten again in a different setting that was a little bit more, um, you know, um, I'm already forgetting the terminology, but a mix much more of um, typically developing and not. And that ended up being a little bit different environment for her. That's, you know, part of the battles that we've had through the years. Um, but it's really just challenging the notion of it. And some of it was desirability, I think, quite frankly. I mean, it's easier when you have school sizes that are larger, which our school system does, you know, I can understand somewhat how teachers, you know, are already overburdened and view this as an extra layer. I mean, I can understand that somewhat. 
But, you know, trying to convince some teachers to provide modifications to materials, um, you know, it would be like, you know, they're asking, we're asking some outrageous thing to be done. And it's like, no, other school systems have more than figured this out. So that's been part of the frustration. But, you know, at least for us, you know, third grade is the defining grade, as you know, Mm -hmm. uh, in IEP world. Um, You know, we made a strategic decision you know, legally, we we could have fought all of the way. I mean, both my wife and I are attorneys by training. I mean, we could have done all of that. But I remember telling my wife at the time, do we want to spend our limited time and energy constantly battling with that? Or do we just do something else in conjunction with the school system on that? And there's pros and cons to that. I know some people will criticize us for doing that because, you know, we are able to do things that many families cannot but the flip side to that is, is everything that Sophia is now known for, her art, really came about through the independent efforts that we had that were then embraced at the school. Right. You know, so it was a different way of showing, you know, others what she could do that then led to a whole different trajectory for her in the, you know, in her school setting. And now it's pretty funny to me because she is pretty well known locally. <laughs> Yeah. You know, and pr- probably with her throughout the little, you know, I-95 corridor between D.C. and Virginia, she's been on the news and in the paper and she's been given opportunities that so many people would just die for. But, you know, again, that was part of what we did for her. That was part of others truly believing in her, too. I mean, none of this could have happened if people did not believe in Sophia. Right. And that mm-hmm. is so very true. The The believing in the child and something that you haven't mentioned, but I... I feel like I'm hearing it in what you're saying is they learned Sophia. They did. They did. And I think in fairness, a lot of people started to believe in Sophia because they saw how much we believed in her. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you have to, what is the old saying? You have to leave the water to the trough. You can leave the horse to water. But yeah, you there you go. I'm horrible at those. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, the, I, I think what many people really started to see was, you know, here are people who are really trying to do the best for their child, like any other parent would do for their kid. So, you know, why aren't we trying to see something a little different from her? And then when they really started to see some of the, you know, art that she was doing, it led to her teacher in middle school to really seeing that. And then she totally has always believed in Sophia, but you know, she's the one who really led the efforts to force Sophia to become part of the gifted program in the arts. It's at, at, through the school system. Oh, you know, she has got to be one of the few kids that are both in the special needs, uh, non certificate track and in the gifted arts program. I don't know many other people that are in those categories together. Yeah. Those don't normally go together. I would no. agree. <laughs> no. Yeah. Um, and then the school has, you know, now she's, you know, become very well embraced by the school. I mean, she did a huge mural for her old elementary school with another local artist. She's working one on the community college. She'll probably do another at a, another local school within the school system. So, I mean, it's been not only a win for her to be known for her art, but it's been a win for the community to see that, hey, look, here is somebody that more traditional ways would have been forgotten for, quite frankly. Right. Right. Exactly. That's the reality. Yeah. And now we're able to show people, look, if you invest time and energy in somebody, I don't care if you're autistic, have Williams, whatever, you know, the, the sky's the limit for you. Why, why should we not do that for these people like we do for anybody else? Exactly. And that's exactly why I have this show, Hashtag No Limits, because we don't know what someone is capable of from today until five years, 10 years from now. And we don't know also what kind of advances in medicine or technology or, you know, if even within their own bodies, maybe something will happen and things suddenly work that didn't work in that way before. Correct. You know, and, and, and that's where I came up with this idea basically is, is because so many times I had a student and I was told by an administrator who was an evaluator of mine that I was wasting my time trying to teach the student to read, that I should really be focusing on life skills and um, uh, life expectancy. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I was flabbergasted. I thought, you're an educator. What do you mean 
telling me I'm wasting time trying to teach this person how to read that and reading is a life skill. So I I just felt like it was a very contradictory, but it was this, this belief that, Oh, well, she's past the age where, you know, by now she should be reading at a certain level based on the age of her peers Mm -hmm. and herself. But uh, yeah, she wasn't there. But now when, I I mean, if I speak to her parents, they talk about when they go to the grocery store or, you know, if they're at home and she'll pick up magazines or she'll read labels at the grocery store. That's great. So, you know, (laughs) I just think, are you kidding me here? I had somebody tell me, Oh, you know, it's, you, you should probably use your time. I think it's how she said it. You should use your time more wisely. Yeah. And, yeah. Okay. It's so, it's so frustrating because then what you want to say ultimately is, well, if you don't build the base now, what is the expectation going to be going forward? Exactly. Cause I can just about guarantee the people who have those point of views are going to be the ones that are going to be the least supportive of public policies to improve the lives of these people as adults. Right. I absolutely agree. <laughs> right. right. Yeah. And, yeah. and, you know, there are teachers and I, you know, I, I worked with absolutely wonderful teachers. The majority of the people I worked with were absolutely wonderful, but yeah, you have those few. And, and I, and I just wondered, why are you even here? Right. You know, I, this doesn't seem like the right field that you should have gone into. And, right. Um, but well, I do want, you know, I do want, I do want to, I'm, I'm a teacher. So, I mean, I don't want to just say that all teachers are bad and. No, know. it's like everything. There's, there's, you know, a different variety of people that are in it. Some have lost their passion for teaching. Some may have had a bad experience because they weren't promoted. Some may be only in it because, you know, if they're on the public school side, you know, their pension may be related to it or their healthcare benefits or right. something like that. And, you know, I understand that, but the bottom line is if you are a teacher you know, you already know going in, you're not going to be making huge amounts of money. Right. So you're you're in it because you truly believe in what you're doing, I would hope. And yeah. if you don't have that, then, you know, it's time for you to figure out what to do. But, you know, that often is not the case. And, you know, again, it depends on the school system. It depends on the school. It depends on the teacher. But in general, um, special education from an administrative standpoint is seen more as a burden than it is as a positive. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, and again, I had great administration and I had not so great administration and the great administration let me do wonderful things Mm -hmm. with the program that I had. And I had a student like you're talking about Sophia being well-known their, their parents were in a veterans day parade and Mm. it was in a different town than the one where they lived. And people all along the route were shouting out this girl's name and saying, that's awesome. You know? And the parent was like, how do all of these people know you? (laughs) But because I had administration and I pushed a little bit and and we got this one particular girl, she wanted to be a cheerleader. So she was a cheerleader for a couple of years, but my whole program was a lot of inclusive activities with their gen ed peers. And, you know, so it was, it was a great opportunity for them. And, and I was always thankful to my administration for, for allowing me to do that. I, I have to say that is so important. And, you know, especially from middle school, freshman wasn't great, but beyond that, you know, having, um, Sophia's teacher, who truly believes in her has really made a very big difference in a lot of those type of inclusive type programs. I mean, you know, her current teacher was the one who in middle school got Sophia involved in cheerleading that came through in the high school level. She's the one who did, as I mentioned before, really push for her to be in the gifted arts program. You know, she's come to several of the receptions that we've had for Sophia's art. I mean, you know, how many people are really doing that? I know that that's an exception and not the rule when we would wish it would be the other way around. Right. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And, and again, you know, I, I'm not throwing my teacher colleagues under the bus. They, they all have lives, they have children, they have, you know, but it's amazing a a little bit of connectivity between a student and a teacher and, and, and belief. And, you know, I mean, I have a a worksheet that not a worksheet, but a kind of a, uh, it's a 40 ways to make relationships with students. And it's, they're not difficult. It's like make eye contact, say right. hi, you know, use their name, ask them how they're feeling, even if right. they're not your student in your classroom. Sure. You know, um, sure. just show that you have interest in them other than that they're supposed to sit in your class and listen and you give them a grade. Right. Um, there's, right. Yeah, there's a lot of things. So you have some beautiful artwork in the back. Well, thank um, you. Here, yes. Yeah, so this is one of Sophia. I'll take this. Those. This is one of Sophia's works. 
that's on my, I guess maybe I don't want to totally turn it here. But these are two. <laughs> so Sophia does watercolors. And then what we do, I'm making everyone sick watching this. Um, so what we do is. Uh, I have to tell them to take Dramamine before this yeah, episode. <laughs> so she uh, does her watercolors here at a local art studio with a, a teacher, Sima Yates, who's been her teacher for quite a while. Uh, and then they do it on rice paper, and then we kind of have a whole process now. So we let them accumulate. She paints with Sime about twice a week, and then from there we let them accumulate. Then we hire a photographer, and then the photographer takes the image, and then uh, this is all about Team Sophia. Then we have our wonderful partners at a design uh, place here, um, Hagashi Glacier, that works with us to do all of the design work to get it ready for print. So the ones you're seeing behind me, are prints of her original watercolors. These are canvas prints 30 by 40. We're able to wow. do it that big. And then we can do much smaller ones too. That's um, awesome. Yeah, yeah. But it's and thank been, you for explaining the process. That's really interesting. Yeah, and it all, you know, it's so funny. And sometimes people will ask us, well, when did you know she was an artist? And when did you know this or that? It, you know, none of this was planned. Right. So, I mean, literally, we put her at Liberty Town Art Studio here in Fredericksburg for one summer class, and nobody knew how this was going to go sure. <laughs> because she did one summer there, and she had taken some smaller type things when she was a little bit smaller. Um, and I should mention, too, we have uh, Sophia's second mom and her sitter who we couldn't do a lot of what we do without her. I mean, she's an integral part of Team Sophia, too. Mm -hmm. um, but, I mean, you know, she did these um, the art lessons there. And then, you know, that led to us talking with the teachers separately to see if maybe she'd have an interest in working with Sophia with some other kids. And then that turned into, you know, she's truly an artist. I want to work with her independently. And then, you know, the whole business side of Sophiola came about through posting on Facebook. And so many people would comment on her pictures and so many people would say, you need to create a business around it. And that's ultimately what we did. And now it's hard to believe we're in year four of the business side. But, you know, we've learned through so much from that because, um, you know, we'd go to various farmers markets. Um, we've had so many opportunities as a result of uh, showcasing her art, doing that. You know, there's been news stories about us about her she's old enough now where you know I, I expect her to come to the tent to help sell her stuff you know occasionally right. um but i mean none of this was a grand plan <laughs> right <laughs> right happened. yeah and yeah. that's actually because of her artwork and where she is showcased with that artwork how you and i became connected because we have a mutual friend at one for all Teresa, well, we have mutual friends. Okay. That, Teresa you know, I was and John. trying to remember how we got <laughs> together, right, right? Yeah, yeah. And so um, I had reached out to Teresa and I said, hey, you've got all these great entrepreneurs here who, you know, have their own uniqueness in all these different ways. Do you think any of them would want to be on? And so she reached out to you and, and voila, here we are. Um, so what I'm about to do is I'm going to share the website. Sure. And um, if you just want to maybe talk to us a little bit about what the website is and how they can access it. And I presume that this is Sophia. It is. So Sophia is our, she's a trip, I have to say. She's a piece <laughs> of work. So this, uh, what I love so much about this picture. So here she's sitting on the steps at the Presbyterian Church locally here in uh, Fredericksburg. Okay. And as I mentioned, she's part of her youth group. So I think this must have been like before Christmas service or something. Mm -hmm. um, but she's, uh, you know, smiling. And then uh, what Byron did at Agashi Glacier. So they actually um, did the design work for us for the website. So even though Carol initially, my wife, set it up on Squarespace, they're the ones who really designed it and finessed it to make it look like it was today. So all the characters that you're seeing around Sophia are uh, different pieces of art that Sophia has painted in images. And then what I think Byron did when he showed us this, I was like, oh my God, I love this. Because she it, it reminds me of, what is it, Snow White with the doors oh, yeah. all around her? Yeah. yeah. Um, but he literally clipped all the little pieces of the various uh, um, characters of her art together to sit with her. Um, so that turned out really great. So Sophia in this photo was probably 16 and a half or 17. Okay. And then the heart image that you're seeing is one of the... Um, a rice paper images that she did probably a year and a half ago. I've lost track. <laughs> um, and then the S that you're seeing, that's our corporate logo. Um, that stands for Sophia. And then 
every piece of art that we sell, we have digitally uh, put on a chop, and they design that as well. And then our thought process is, is that if we have other artists eventually under the Sofiola brand, that they'll get their own chop. But, you know, truly all of this, the website included, you know, if you click on the website, you can read about her stories. You can see the media stories behind it. We do have an online shop with a flat shipping charge. Then you can see the arts that you want to purchase. But what I tell folks all the time is, you know, this is half about Sophia and half being ambassadors for the differently abled. And this has really enabled us to be, you know, true advocates, not only for Sophia, but to just to get so many people focused on what we initially were talking about, of the possibilities that, you know, people can bring if we highlight them. I don't care if it's um, painting. I don't care if it's music. I don't care if it's baking, like, you know, Coletta's cookies. I mean, she's becoming internationally known for her cookies. I mean, John Socks, you know, who does um, amazing socks. These are all examples of folks that really can, you know, bring wonders to the differently able community and change the dynamic for everybody, just like Teresa has done, you know, for One for All and other folks that are doing this across the country. We're all in it together is our philosophy. We're all happy to promote each other. You know, this is um, not a true money-making adventure. (laughs) Right. You know, this is a way to uh, hopefully provide a pathway for Sophia to live an independent, fulfilled life. And I think what many people in the, that are not part of the differently able community do not understand is, you know, the unemployment rates for uh, differently abled folks can reach almost 90 percent depending on the state. You know, we're in the process of doing all the SSI type things. Um, but, you know, the laws are very frustratingly designed and I get the purpose behind it, but it is very frustrating because we spend all of our time trying to show the world what Sophia can do. And yet when it comes time to apply for disability benefits or everything, you have to do the exact reverse, just like an IEP world when it comes to services to show how little they can do so that they qualify. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a really weird world (laughs) on that. Yeah. Right. No. And, and I totally, and someone, it may have been the same interview that I had where the gentleman changed the curriculum for his daughter, but he was saying that he, gets very frustrated when he goes to these meetings because we do only focus on the negatives and we right. should, we should reverse that and talk about all the positives. Right. And he has uh, this particular individual that I'm thinking of has a karate business. And mm. he says, you know, all of my students are capable. I have quote unquote, able-bodied and quote unquote, disabled body individuals in my karate studio. And we focus on what they can do because They'll get there in a lot of times eventually. It just, and again, that path might look a little bit different. Right. Um, right. So I've stopped on this particular one because I'll be placing an order for this. Um, <laughs> because as I said at the beginning, you know, the butterfly is sort of my my analogy for, for what I do. And so my question is, and I think you've answered it, but I just want to be clear on this. So um, if I was to order this one, three weeks from now, somebody else could come and order the same one because they're prints of originals, right? That's that's correct. So okay. um, our wonderful partners, uh, they actually fill the internet orders for us. Okay. Uh, so we could not do what we do without them. <laughs> right. And, and one of the things I should say, and again, you know, we're fortunate to be able to do things that other folks can't. I know that. But, you know, we wanted to be realistic as to what we could and could not do. Because, you know, I have a full-time job demanding one. My wife does, too. Um, You know, we knew that we could not spend every evening filling orders from a garage. Right. So, you know, by having, by basically delegating that out, we wanted to be as professional as we could and as consistent as we could that this business would be treated no differently than any other business. You know, we, we try to set it up in a way that people are going to buy for it because of the quality, because they want it, not because they feel sorry for her. Right. 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 Absolutely. Because there's nothing to feel sorry for. <laughs> right. She has an incredibly fulfilled life. I know that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And that that's exactly. There's nothing to feel sorry for. That's just, right. that's just right. And what you're seeing here. So this is uh, the top picture on the right. You're seeing was the beginnings of the mural that was at Hugh Mercer. 
her old elementary school. And this she worked with a different artist here in town, Gabriel Pons, who when we started, you know, what we try to do is build upon Sophia's art knowledge so that she's not just doing only watercolors, even though that's clearly her medium, but to expose her to different things. So somehow I suggested this artist, Gabe, because I knew he did some funky work and I liked his work. I think I must have bought it from my office is where it generated from. And then one thing led to another and we asked if he could, you know, work with Sophia. And again, the world where the the world works in mysterious ways. So this was all meant to be. So I had no idea that he was a muralist. Okay. So he ended up working with Sophia to design this mural. And what you're seeing here is a poster that he designed, which was really pretty cool because we put it all around downtown Fredericksburg in particular. But interested folks could scan the QR folk and then make a contribution towards um, the mural, which we actually underwrote the. Um, uh, cost uh, primarily of the mural. The school paid for the supplies. Sofiola paid for everything else. So when you indirectly make a purchase, you're indirectly funding things like this. Mm-hmm. Um, but what was great about it is all the contributions went to J.M. Pales, which at James Monroe High School here in Fredericksburg is a group that's um, between more uh, typically developing kids and kids who are differently able together. It is kind of like a best buddies type group. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so where are all these? What's happening? Down so there? that's showing kind of the progression of the mural. Okay. If you go on the media tab, there is actually uh, ABC Seven in the district of uh, Columbia here in Washington came and did a big story for us. Our local okay. tourism board did, uh, you know, an announcement of it. We're going to be having an official ribbon cutting of the ceremony next month. Um, but again, we've been very, very blessed with the good publicity. And again, a lot of it has to do with, you know the people who believe in Sophia. So not only her main teacher at school, but the head of the special ed department has been a huge advocate for Sophia. And she's really a huge part of why this mural came together was through her efforts, putting everyone together. So those, this kind of headline gets me um, because that's, I can't see it. What does it say? Oh, I'm sorry. It says doctor said she'd only live a few days. Now she's 17 and helping create a stunning mural. Yeah. This is hashtag no limits right there. Right. right. And yeah. that is, that is just amazing to me. So something that um, I will be doing behind the scenes once this is over. And unfortunately um, I'm looking at the time and we are going to be wrapping up here shortly is um, I'm going to be trying to connect you to someone here in the St. Louis metropolitan area um, who is putting, putting is the wrong word, is is getting everything in order to have a park, a theme park for every body. And it's called Spirit of Discovery Park. Jamie Van is, is, has now become a friend of mine. She was on the hashtag No Limits a long time ago to talk about this. Mm. Um, and so I'm guessing based on this, and so please correct me if I'm wrong, that if Sophia is hired for something, she would, it's not just her own designs. Like she would produce something with an, you know, in maybe collaboration with, um, you know, like, in oh, this yeah. I mean, you know, she needs to be working with somebody. She can't right. do this all independently. Right. Um, but certainly with collaboration and, you know, again, we've learned with Sophia, you just go for the ride. One thing leads to another leads to another. Uh-huh. So, you know, like um, she's having her second uh, art exhibition at Children's National Medical Center in the district where she's had most of her surgeries. They were the first one to host the whole show for her. So there's going to be 26 pieces of her work in 30 by 40 canvas sizes down the main corridor of the hospital. That's really pretty cool. Yeah. And her first show had 40. We had another um, really great opportunity a couple of years ago. Some folks I met at a farmer's market that we were vending at And one thing led to another. And before you know it, we were having uh, we were part of First Friday in Richmond in the Art Walk. And that led to a whole different thing. So, again, you never know what's going to happen with her. So actually, somebody who showed up to that remembered her rooster painting, this rooster painting that she did. So many people love. We have sold many different images and sizes of it. But then literally she was a set designer with Lovesick. That's a a dope sick. Excuse me. A brand new show that just premiered on Hulu. Yeah. So 
her art may be on that show. We haven't seen it yet. I keep looking for it. Oh my gosh, that just gave me goosebumps right. because I just learned about that show the other day and I thought, oh, that's something I think I'm yeah, going to be interested so, in mean, watching. And that's just how it's been with Sophia. One thing just kind of leads to another. So we ended up having a whole story done by her by um, uh, Greg McQuaid, I think it was, from um, the CBS affiliate in Richmond. And I think all of that came about because a producer for the show ended up coming to this art show. So yeah. that's been the genesis of, the, of all of this stuff. That's so amazing. Yeah. And that, that picture of, um, and I've stopped sharing the screen, but if, if you would like me to go back to share anything from the website, I will. But the picture on the About Sophia page that where she was in the cute little outfit oh, yeah. with the sunglasses. Yeah. Oh, what a doll. That's totally <laughs> Sophia. So Sophia you know, really likes fashion. I mean, she was born to be a socialite. So she's happiest going out to eat. Uh -huh. And, you know, just hanging out yeah. every day when we say, how's school, Sophia? Well, I had such and such for lunch. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I'm not asking about lunch. <laughs> yeah, that was the most important part for her. Oh, you want it's to all about the food academically. for Sophia. <laughs> right, right. Well, yeah. I have to say that's been one really interesting thing is so many of our differently able kids had a really tough time during COVID with virtual learning. Um, and, you know, it was not great. Um, you know, everyone was trying to do the best they could. We teased that we were retaking high school with her. But right. I have to say, you know, she was a very happy kid through through it. I mean, she missed her friends, but she didn't dwell on any of that. Yeah. You know, so yeah. we're fortunate that she's generally a pretty happy, easy-go-lucky kid. Yeah. And I'm sorry, I'm chuckling because um, I have another show that I do on Fridays called Friday with Fran. And um, she has become someone who is disabled in the last few years. But the, the other reason that we have it is because she has raised two children with disabilities mm. and one of the children has um, Down syndrome. And so we talk a lot about, you know, the the biases that people have and the, the misconceptions. And she brings that one up frequently that, oh, people with Down syndrome are always happy. Right. <laughs> and, no. And, they're still humans. Sure. They're not yeah. always anything. Exactly. Exactly. No, but we're fortunate. And, you know, my son is the same thing, too. He, You know, I was born an optimist. You know, my wife is a little less optimistic than I am. But, you know, our kids are very, they're just, they're easygoing kids uh, and adults. You know, they get sad like everybody does, et cetera. But by and large, they're you know, not morose kids or, you know, they're inquisitive kids that, you know, are generally happy. They like to be around others, but they're fine being by themselves too. That we're very fortunate for that. Yeah. And in my experience, most of the students that I ever worked with as a special education teacher were more in a lot of areas than mm -hmm. their typical developing peers. Mm -hmm. And by that, I mean, they were more compassionate. They had yeah. Um, more effort that they put into their work. They were more willing to try and fail. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, and so when people would, would say things to me, it's like, if you could just see beyond the shell, right? you would see so much more that is going on. So Andre, I, we do just have a few more minutes. I try never to go longer than an hour. So I want to make sure this has been a wonderful conversation, but as, as I told you from the beginning, this is your story. This is Sophia's story. And so I want to make sure before we wrap up that if there's anything that you really wanted to say to somebody or say about Sophia, that you get that opportunity to do that in these last few minutes. Sure. Well, I, I'm, I, I should have said at the beginning, I'm so sorry, Sophia couldn't be a part of this. It dawned on me when I saw at the time, I was like, oh, wait, she's still in school. Yeah. <laughs> and I think that my um, wife had a, a meeting she couldn't come to. But I think the biggest takeaway for your viewers is to know that truly the limits that people have are ones they put on themselves or they allow others to put on them. Yeah. So, you know, when it comes to our special needs children, you know, don't accept less, you know, it, it, do what you would do like you would for any other child. And everyone has different abilities for advocating, financial resources, knowledge bases, et cetera. But my takeaway for folks is, is do the best you can, be realistic with your time and your energy and where you want your battles to be. 
because you cannot be fighting constantly because there's more to life to all of that. So figure out what lane you want to go in and then try to come up with a balance that's going to end up working for you. Because I think what happens in the special needs world too often is we lose sight of the bigger picture. And the bigger picture is, is that our children are going to become adults. And what is going to be the game plan for them when they're no longer in school, when we're older, when we're going to get sick and need the support of our folks? What's going to happen to our loved ones when we are deceased? Because we're all going to die. We're all born right. and we all die. That's right. finite. So, you know, what can we do to create plans for them for the present and the future, not focusing so far on the future that you neglect the present, but same right. vice versa, right? Balance. Yeah. But And to be, you know, realistic with what you can do. But ultimately, all of this is really how are you going to better the experience for them and for you and your communities? Because it's not just about you. It's right. about, you know, being real advocates for everybody for and, and to show the community at large that, you know, your loved one is an integral part of the community and has something to add and be a part of. And how do you do that in a way that's going to be effective? Because in the environment we are now, I have to say I'm extremely fortunate doing what I do because I'm forced to work with a lot of different people of opinion, education, et cetera. But how can we bridge differences, whether they be political, religious, economic, sexual orientation, whatever, so that we can advance the ball in a better direction for all. That's really the challenge that I would impart for folks. Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you so much for that. And again, I thank you so much for, for squeezing me into your schedule. And I'm so oh, glad. Well, we thank you able. for the opportunity. Yeah. And I, maybe we can do this again sometime where we do it in the evening yeah. and Sophia is able to join us. I know we tried to do it in the summertime and right, she's so right. busy that we couldn't make the schedule work. So um, it is what it is. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you everyone who's watching in the replay and who joined us live. Make sure again that you like it, you subscribe on the YouTube channel, you follow this page so that you don't miss any episodes of hashtag no limits and that you learn about all these wonderful people who are doing amazing things. And, and maybe your perspective changed the whole concept of the, uh, religious people, um, you know, that, that sector of the world being talking and not walking. Um, that was a new one for me today. So good, I, I good. appreciate that. You know, it's, I don't just do this for the audience. I do this for myself too, sure. because I'm, you got to practice what you preach. It's easy exactly. to preach. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Absolutely. All right. Well, thanks everybody. Thanks, Andre. I Thank so you so much. Hey, parents and teachers, are you tired of IEP meetings that feel like a battle? Let's put an end to the tension and create a collaborative, calm, and respectful environment together. Shelly Kino, your go-to IEP consultant, can transform your meetings into positive and productive experiences. With Shelly Kino, your child is her top priority, your voice is heard, and you become confident. Shelly Kino is making the world better for all, one IEP at a time. Visit www.shellykino.com for more information and set up your free 20-minute consultation today. That's shellykino.com, S-H-E-L-L-E-Y-K-E-N-O-W.